All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Milan Kulkarni. I'm the Associate Head of Teaching and Learning in ECE. I'm also uh, a professor of computer engineering. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to our first Stories of Success seminar uh, of the fall semester. I'm really excited uh, about uh, the opportunity you guys are about to have to hear from one of our esteemed alumni, uh, Sumit Maniar. So Sumit Maniar is now the CEO of Wellbrain. Uh, which is looking at um, problems at the intersection of deep learning and um, healthcare. But he's done a tremendous number of other things in his career since he got his bachelor's from Purdue back in 1992. Um, he's worked at a number of companies, many of which you've heard of, like Xerox, Verizon, and Accenture. He's also got multiple decades of experience in startups. Um, he went and got his MBA from another Midwestern school that I'm not going to name. Uh, but he has a tremendous amount of experience in, in technology and consulting. Uh, across a wide variety of domains. Um, recently, he's been focusing a lot on applications of AI and machine learning, but also uh, dabbling in blockchain. So if you guys have questions about those kinds of hot emerging topics, I'm sure he would be happy to, to answer them. Um, so I'm really excited to have him join us uh, to share with you uh, his experiences at Purdue and uh, the wisdom that he has gained there and since. To moderate our discussion, I'm uh, pleased to introduce Avik Radva. He is uh, one of our HK, HKN uh, members, and he is going to be uh, moderating, the, moderating the discussion, asking questions, fielding questions from you guys. Um, so I think he's going to get us started, and then you guys will all have an opportunity to ask questions by typing them in the uh, panel uh, box below that you see on Zoom. So uh, with that, Sumit, welcome. Avik, take it away. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kilkenny, for the introduction. So to start us off, uh, Sumit, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is like coming back to Purdue um, as a success story for other students to learn from? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, you know, when I graduated from high school, I had this mindset I was going to do engineering and then some type of master's, either as master's in engineering and definitely an MBA. And so I did two out of the three in the sense of that aspect. And then I selected Purdue largely because at that time, and it's probably there present because it had a strong co-op program so you could get the experience right away. But immediately I was able to get a internship at Xerox for all three summers. So I just did the full year at Purdue, went to Xerox each summer. And uh, reflecting back and everything, yeah, I think it was a great experience. There was definitely, it's probably true to the case, but uh, sophomore and junior year were really, really tough. And, uh, but that helped uh, set the stone for what I wanted to do was combination of business. But if you look at the future of all types of business, it involves almost any type of engineering discipline for growth. And so I started out in the hardware space and the software, or I should say, you know, the software running the hardware and then eventually applications of uh, that software aspects. And I also was, I guess, looking back, I had the opportunity to ride the internet wave, helping put in some of the infrastructure of the internet and then drive many of my successes are basically effectively applications of the internet. So I think I couldn't, I kind of planned it this way, but I didn't plan it exactly. And then one last thing is I had this vision of traveling around the world and I was fortunate to be based all around the world. One other thing is I did spend 10 years also in the video games industry. So a lot of different experiences. Wow, that is a really cool background. So I wanted to also talk to you a little bit more about Purdue. Yeah. Um, so when you decided to go to Purdue, what were some of the factors that made you choose it over other colleges? Yeah, and uh, I'll just name competitors. I, I got into Hopkins and some, maybe an, uh, an Ivy League and then also like Virginia Tech and Penn State, uh, I remember those days, like yeah, maybe Cor yeah, Cordell. And I decided Purdue largely because they had just started, I think ECE was just starting at that time. So it was before that, it was just the School of Electrical Engineering. And as soon as I joined, it became School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that was one of the factors. And the second large factor was more influence from my dad in the sense that, hey, they have this great co-op program. You should really look into it because, you know, if you get a degree with a job, it'll be easier to get 
uh, a job. So, so that, that was some of the aspects. Yeah, and the co-op program has really grown over the years. A lot of Purdue students opt for that opportunity. Um, I, on a less serious note, what were some of your favorite memories about Purdue? What do you still remember from back in, <laughs> back in the days? <laughs> Well, I remember, I forgot what it's called. Like, uh, what's the, you stay up all night before home football games and stuff like that, <laughs> and partying that. Uh, uh, so those are some memories uh, with respect to that. I think uh, a lot of the friends, I remember uh, my first year was a little bit tough and being an engineer, it was really tough to do social things because you're just busy with classes. But then I joined clubs and stuff and I developed a lot of friends. So outside of that, uh, I, I definitely my junior and senior years were uh, quite enjoyable. I could have, uh, I had enough AP credits to graduate early and my dad wanted me to. It's like, no, no, I'm going to stay. And I'm glad I stayed the, you know, finished off my senior year and uh, took some advanced electives with some of the professors. So I got to do some fun stuff. And then I had a little more free time to be social too. So I remember those days. Uh, yeah. That's, that's a pretty great memory. Um, also, I wanted to ask you about uh, some of the traditions that we had at Purdue. Um, what was your favorite tradition? Favorite tradition? Um, let's see, I'm trying to I don't know if you guys, we used to do stuff with the mortar board and I don't know if that still exists. Uh, I remember Slater Hill. I don't know if people sled down the, I don't know if cafeteria trays still exist. Like we used to take those and slide down them when it snowed and uh, some of those tradition. And then uh, we do little things like we get special students seating. I think at that time, engineering even got special students seating for the basketball games. So that was, that was fun too. So. Uh, those are the things that come up to the top of my head and I was pretty exploratory too like I remember taking advantage of the Purdue golf courses and uh, just I'm open-minded and stuff so I remember the, some of those experiences uh, yeah wow uh, that's that's great Cafet uh, cafeteria trees actually they're gone now but <laughs> <laughs> so I'm dating myself <laughs> yeah but Slater Hill I mean we people still slide down it I remember last year there were a few accidents but there was also a lot of fun <laughs> and uh yeah people partied a lot uh around slater hill uh, as soon as it started snowing yeah uh do you know the tradition of like walking under the bell tower not walking under the bell tower specifically well I, the bell tower yes was completed my sophomore year so all that stuff was there when we were there but i don't know if that tradition started walking under the bell tower or not i don't remember that uh yeah. I, I remember we used to a lot of times students would soak the fountain you know throw a bunch of tide detergent in it and then there'd be soap subs all over the place i don't know if that still happens <laughs> uh yeah people do throw around tide detergent pods sometimes uh yeah and uh after the bell tower was built people said that it would be bad luck to walk under the bell tower so everyone just goes around it um, yeah, that's oh, okay. That's true. I remember. I don't think I've ever walked underneath it. Yeah, I remember that now. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's really good. Um, and at Purdue, what was your favorite class? Okay, so engineering wise, so electrical engineering, I really liked some of the communication classes, if uh, I remember correctly. I couple the and I, at that time, there was some EC class. I remember taking this class on maglev because maglev technology was kind of new. So some of those electives were kind of neat and uh, learning how to optimize, you know, magnet flow and everything. And then there was a computer engineering course. I don't remember. It was called 363. I don't know if that's still there. It's mainly you learn assembly, which is not the funnest thing. But once you learn assembly, you can learn almost any coding language get into Unix and all that. So I don't know if you guys, if they still teach. The yeah. yeah, that's actually, I think it's EC, they call it EC 362 now. It's okay. microprocessors and systems. I'm taking that class right now. Okay, perfect, okay. perfect. That is a really great class, yeah. Um, and the professor we have for it, the instructor, he's yeah. amazing as well. Uh, and did you also have like a least favorite class? 
I remember, I don't want to make fun of the professor, but it was the class. Uh, I was just told Professor DiCarlo just uh, retired, but what was the follow-on course after him? There was a professor who gave scoring uh, worse than an SAT. So if you had answered question wrong, you'd get a negative score. And that was the worst class because I think 75% of the people failed. And even on a curve, people got C's and D's. It was just like, and I think <laughs> the professor was removed after that, but that was like my worst course. I think it was not digital logic design, but uh, whatever Professor Carlo taught, it was uh, after that, uh, I can't remember, but uh, yeah, that was probably my worst course. And then on the physics side, there was a, prof a German professor who did the same thing. He would negative score people. And I think uh, he got removed also because so many people ended up failing those courses. Luckily I didn't fail, but still I got like a B in both, but uh, it was just a <laughs> dreadful experience in those extremes. Yeah, was there ever a moment where like um, all students got negative scores, the scores were not even positive or was it really harsh negative scoring i just remember the professor just making fun of students like hey this person shouldn't even bother showed up he would at least got a zero as opposed to a negative score so i oh. i don't think there was anyone uh that got the like the whole class got negative scores but uh you know i think that one test i think the highest score was a 30. so <laughs> but i do remember vividly we were just like all shocked at each other he's just like yeah this person shouldn't have showed up this person shouldn't have showed up and we we're just like whoa Wow. So talking about professors, uh, could you tell me about a professor who shaped your thoughts and inspired you to who you are today? So I think uh, one of the things uh, I was really, there was uh, one professor in signal processing and then Professor Delp in communications. And I remember the first class he did a walk because everyone does freshman engineering. And then at that time you have to select electrical engineering and that time MSWE was just brand new opened and literally they were taking out punch block machines, which is probably before your time, but you know, the old IBM stuff and they're putting in all these other things. And then there was this room full of Apple Lisa's and he, you know, the, he said, watch in five years time, everything's going to be wireless. You guys will be like zipping around like there is nothing. And so that was one of the things that enticed me about Purdue. All these things professors were, talking about it evolved right there and then because those professors were doing the research right then and then you couldn't visualize it at the point but as you're learning the theories and doing some foundation stuff you see it now right i mean 5g spectrum wireless i mean back then it was just analog cell phones actually the first uh, phones were the car based ones right so it's it's cool to see a lot of those uh, technologies coming to play yeah that's a that's a really great uh, answer to that question and um moving on to some questions about your career we have a question from the from one of the attendees mm -hmm. um they want to know if you could tell us more about your time in the game industry yeah so gaming is interesting in the sense that of course uh, i grew up in the days when uh, there was just uh you know digital sprite images on games where you connected to a cathode ray tube. And now what we did in the gaming industry was uh, actually a fellow Purdue colleague of mine. Um, so a little bit of background, we were, we got into the gaming industry largely because we wanted to push the internet further. So what happened was when the internet first came out, it was all dial up, it was 56K bits per second that's I've, I've worked in or I remember uh, being in high school we would do 200 baud modems which is even much slower and then so what we did was uh, there was a, a friend of mine who graduated from the industrial engineering and we were both at Anderson Consulting at the time he got an opportunity to spend some time in Korea now Korea and Japan about 20 years ago was already doing fiber optic to the home and because of that, they had all these technologies already advanced. And one of them was games. So having played video games, you know, as a kid, and then we're just like, wow, we need to replicate this technology and bring it to the West. And so how we got into that is we started working in massively multiplayer online games, which are 
large clients, large servers. And at that time, the throughput was very low. So you had to overcome latency and lag and all these technical issues. But what we did is we ended up partnering with all the telecom companies at the time because DSL, uh, digital subscriber links were popular. That helped push internet adoption because in the early 2000s, many people were just satisfied. What do I need high-speed internet for? I can do my email. I can just send one photograph here or there because there was nothing else to do. So that's how we got into the video game industry. And uh, what we did was we first took some games from overseas, converted them into English, and then we started making some of our games. And then we built a whole platform ourselves. And as that was happening, internet high speed started growing because people were doing that. And then we got into mobile games, the first wave. And that, so that, that's how we got into or how I got into internet games. And because of that, I had to help establish, we rode the internet wave in many different countries. So I set up offices in different countries and where the technical prowess comes in, if you think about it, the analytics and stuff, if you work with the internet, I, I don't know if that's a special class at Purdue or, you know, you have to, I remember I had to learn the seven layers of the, you know, the OSI stack and, you know, all the communication levers and then first work with routers to see how they work. but that technical know-how and background still gives me fluency wherever I am and now, whether it's working in all these other industries and stuff. So, uh, you know, the Purdue education helped with that. Uh, you know, at the time when you first graduate, you probably don't respect it as much, but uh, if I look back, that that helped a lot. So to answer your question, yeah, that's how I got into gaming and uh, hundreds of games that, that I probably worked on or worked with. Yeah, that that is a really great answer. And that reminds me that um, the gaming industry does have a huge impact on everything. I remember that U Unity and other physics softwares, they're still used for research um, in 3D modeling. So that's pretty great. Um, now, I wanted to ask you on a related note, what is one thing that you wish you would have known uh, when you were at Purdue uh, that you got to know through your career and experiences? I'll answer that question. One comment about the gaming industry, I'll add on to that. What we didn't expect was we got to build so many technologies at the time. And it's related to your second question. Had someone told us what we knew, what we were doing. So some of the first games we built, we built our first, first payment systems. No one told us that we could create a whole business separate for payment. We built our own chat systems. And so as you look at gaming, we got to adapt so many different technologies. We were putting cloud in the sky because we thought it was a more cost-effective solution. We didn't think about commercializing it. Uh, we worked in a little bit of AI, think of millions of players, all the data points, you have to mine it and start looking at it. So we we're looking at patterns. We had to hire economists because we couldn't figure out how to maintain the game flow. So it was an unexpected benefit. So getting back to your question, uh, I wish one of the two things that happened, I think for you guys, there's a lot more democratization of ability to, if you have an idea, you could develop the concept and then uh, maybe start a business. About it. I'm not like recommended from the get go, but at least when we, when I was in school, both my friend, my, my friend from Purdue, he was Korean American, I'm Indian American, and of course, of Asian parents, you know, we wanted to start our own web design business and even everyone around us like, you're stupid to start a business now, just work at their regular job. And, you know, had we stuck with our first business, which was designing websites, because at that time, no one even thought about it. So I wish someone would have given us guidance, like saying, hey, it might be okay, especially at a younger age to take a little bit more risk because you can afford to, because you don't have a family and all these other things. So I wish a little bit of some guidance, even that, and even maybe five to seven years out. Now, I think because everyone hears about people creating ideas and working on stuff, and I hear about all the stuff that uh, some of the development office people that have reached out to me, that all the things that Purdue doing is fantastic. And I wish there was uh, some of that there. And uh, the only other thing I would say at Purdue, I wish I would have taken more lab courses because it's great to learn theory, but you learn so much more on the application side of things too. Mm -hmm. 
That makes a lot of sense. I think uh, there's a question from the audience that is kind of related to what you were talking about. Um, and they would like to know that, did you expect the online gaming industry to grow to what it is today? Uh, no, because what it surprises everyone at the uh, magnitude that has grown and how much mobile games has grown recently. Maybe that's because of COVID, but now everyone's going back, it's still growing. So when we got into the gaming industry, you have to show projections to venture capitalists. And we were thinking it might be a 20 to $30 billion industry by 2018 or so. I think now it's like 140, 160 billion. So it's just mind boggling how big it is. So no, it's just amazing. Uh, whether it's video games, whether it's consoles, whether it's mobile game, but you know, some interesting statistics uh, statistics from that is if you count casual games, I think the stats still hold through true that 50%, 51% of all gamers are women between the ages of 35 to 45. So the classic hardcore male gamer might be there, but it isn't if you look at it from a <laughs> overall perspective. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, transitioning to a sort of different topic, um, we all know that we have been through a lot these past two years and during the COVID times. So what advice would you offer to students as they near graduation um, and transition to a post-COVID professional world? Well, I think there's a lot of opportunity out there. I think uh, one thing I, I've been fortunate enough to live across the US and stuff. And one thing I see is, you know, everyone wants to, uh, one guidance is don't get attracted by the 100% shiny object in the sense that, you know, I, I only came to the Bay Area five years ago and it's only because I was overseas and we had this visa issue of my wife and State Department said, hey, you better move back to the States otherwise your wife's green card's gonna, get messed up so we're like okay let's just pick the bay area and move but what, what i'm trying to get at there's a lot of good opportunities across the country and now with this COVID environment even though you can work remotely i would say try to work with teams first because you'll develop as a person and then you can work remotely one of the things i've experienced because one of the things when we set up the gaming company or some of the other experiences even with Wellbrain, which is a digital health company. I have the back-end developers in Latvia, the front-end developers in India. We've never met, but what I'm trying to say is like, you can accelerate relationships much faster if you even work face-to-face -face with someone, if you can, for two to three months. And then once you know that person, you can work remotely and help, um, manage or collaborate remotely with teams much more effectively. So. I think uh, to for guidance for students who are looking for opportunities now, you know, it uh, you could go for the master's uh, degree in engineering and then look for something, or you can work and then go back. And I think uh, the opportunity cost is not that great. I'm at least seeing across my colleagues, whether they work at Facebook or all these other companies, they're setting up more and more offices all over the place. And, uh, you know, skilled, resources are in a shortage of this country. And uh, if you look at the computing and engineering resources, I think it's a still a shortage of 2 million. So, and mm -hmm. I don't care. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, my mom lives in Cleveland now. There's, I saw one company, they can't find people in that area for certain type of roles. And, uh, you know, all these cities need resources. So yeah, you could, work for Amazon or Google, which is fantastic. And I'm not discounting that, but there's so many other opportunities and then you can always move to those companies too. So just uh, think about those factors as well, because a lot of areas are super expensive uh, to live in. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, yeah, I just hope that things are as normal as possible and you're able to work together as engineers. I think that's a pretty important part of the job. So um, yeah. I'll add one thing. So when I was at Anderson Consulting, which is now known as Accenture, I got this opportunity at the time. It's called the Infocosm Multimedia Factory, and I got assigned to it as a network solution special. And network solutions meant like laying the foundations of local area network, wide area networks. And at that time, 
there was asynchronous transfer mm -hmm. mode, which is based on fiber optic. There are all these technologies we're evaluating. And one of the things I learned initially as a kid, or I should say fresh graduate, you know, everyone wanted the cool cities, the same thing. Oh, Manhattan, there's a project in Manhattan with, uh, you know, Belcor or something like that. Okay. But what someone taught me was a manager is like, go for the most interesting projects where you can learn the most. And, you know, there was something in rural South Dakota and I ended up choosing one in Jefferson City, Missouri. So I actually lived in Jefferson City, Missouri for six months, but I got an opportunity to help set up their judicial network and criminal systems, information systems, which, you know, the New York one was more like a boondoggle, if you will, it was just writing, um, not even working with the computer, it was just writing um, like word essays. And that was the project, which, you know, you didn't learn much, but you learned anyway. So what, what I'm trying to get that there's sometimes really interesting opportunities, no matter where you go or look at. So sorry, yeah. That, uh, that's really good advice. Um, so I wanted to ask, that you mentioned your time in your early career, how you got to see the development of internet. And I think you were in a really unique position um, that you got to experience that. So I wanted to know what lessons and insights did you uh, get from this experience? And how has it shaped the way that you see the evolution of computer technology? So from the internet, it was, I think looking back, yeah, a couple of things. I, I, I wish I had some more senior guidance in the sense, but the internet created so many opportunities that I probably could have been a gazillionaire if I would have been a little bit smart enough that, <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is the internet created a lot of opportunities. And if you think about it, that was a, a department defense initiative and working with private enterprise and how it worked. And it was just amazing one step after another. So the first wave of the internet was through dial up and then, you know, browsers, browsers was the newest thing. I will say technology was changing so fast. It was hard to keep uh, on top of it. So when I entered Purdue, we had one and a, two weeks of Pascal got thrown out. Then we had uh, some Fortran that got thrown out. Then it became C, and then I learned C++ a little bit. And then as soon as I graduated, everyone was talking about Java and object-oriented programming. And I was like, am I getting obsolete already? So, and this is happening with the internet taking off too. So one of the things I learned is like, you have to stay on top of it like really fast and development cycle. So I think one of the things I learned over time is and this is one book you guys should read. It's it's about 10, 12 years old. It's by uh, Eric Ries. It's, uh, what is it called? Uh, it's about product management. And if I rec can recall the title off the top of my head, and I'll, I'll share it with the faculty and they can share it. But what it does is it teaches you, especially if you're trying to develop a product and solution, think of it of the end customer mind and how they're going to use it. And taking a step back, that's one of the things as a Xerox engineer, when I was a hardware engineer, Xerox did something fantastic at the time. They would put every engineer out in the field, meaning they showed how the technicians work with their products, showed how the customer interface. So you start designing things that are easier to access and better to uh, solve. So the same thing with product management, because if you look at engineering, ultimately you're bringing building product right but you shouldn't think it just in the construct of you know equations and everything you should think about how are people going to use it and everything so that was some of the things that i learned through the advent of the internet in the sense that i got to work on this initiative that uh, eventually became orbits you know at the time it was like literally the first stage of the internet was I got exposure to it at Anderson Consulting, where we were given assignments. Let's build a prototype of building a pick your own seat and book an airline thing because uh, Accenture had built the technology for the six digit uh, reservation code. So they had a lot of the expertise. So that was really cool to see all these applications that you built firsthand and then becoming businesses, of course, 
I wish, like I said earlier, if someone had told us, hey, you can make this into a business, go do it, right? So I would say the internet, if I had to relive everything again, I would relive the growth of the internet and but be more smart about how to go about it. But I think there's still a lot of opportunities to leverage. I think uh, if you look at artificial intelligence, it's just at the tip, but then you have to think about bias, right? I get questions from in the healthcare space, like how do you eliminate bias? Just because you and I get involved in it, it might create some you know, tracking and the AI will start drifting, right? So these are interesting solutions. So I think uh, there's a lot of interesting things, but uh, to re-answer your question, I think I, I learned a lot and this is probably the first time I've had asked this question, like, what did I learn from the growth of the internet? And I think there's probably a lot of things, but the key thing is talk to customers, or if you have a product or solution, always get feedback and validate those responses, and then you can build a better product. So you, you might start up with a concept A and saying, oh yeah, this is the best solution, but you might end up with A prime, A double prime, A just that iterative, building and if you think about coding coding is just iterative coding yeah i think that's a really good answer and it's definitely something to teach us in uh, business model classes um on a different note we have a question from the audience okay um so being an indian american at any point in your career did you face any kind of discrimination or hardships related to race in, uh, including USA and any other places that you have lived abroad? Uh, I, maybe not. There was a little bit after 9-11 that I was born in the US, but I've spent time in Indiana, I've lived in different countries where a little bit of nine after 11, there were a couple of people. I was in Chicago at the time and I'd be walking and someone would yell at me, go back to your country and stuff like that. Uh, but as far as overt discrimination, I haven't faced it. And maybe because, I mean, maybe some ad hoc, but not significant enough that it felt really bad. But I will say there's been incidents here or there, whether it's being in Australia, like being called a curry head and little things like that. So if I start thinking about it, but in the US, it was a little bit less, at least that was my experience. And I'm trying to incorporate my cousins, my sisters and all that. And Generally, it hasn't been a problem. Now, my parents' generation, they did experience a little bit of a glass ceiling in the sense that, you know, hey, we have we can't have too many Asian executives and stuff at the time. But I think that mindset has now changed. But uh, yeah, so I think, you know, that's my answer. To you. All right. Okay. So coming back uh, to some of the questions. Uh, after earning your BSCE from Purdue in 1992, uh, you went to earn your MBA from the University of Chicago. Uh, for students who are considering graduate school right now versus uh, the stability of a full-time job, what are the, some of the pros and cons that you recommend uh, we consider? So my mindset was, and a lot of my friends at the time was, if it was engineering, then go for the master's right away in engineering. Now, if it's MBA, I always had a the thought process and some business schools have a different change of process, but it's I think it's almost better to get five years of practical experience because then you can leverage some of the things you learn from just working and then you can better apply yourself from business school. Now, even the one I went to, which they don't wanna mention, but it's probably there on my record, they, they have some accelerated programs for undergrads straight into MBA, and they encourage some of that. But part of the class, they, they try to look at like people with work experience. So to me, my recommendation, and uh, you know, if I was giving advice to a nephew or someone, it's like better to get some work experience, then you can reflect on those experience, and then you can rev leverage those relationships better from uh, the MBA. So it may, you'll find the MBA much more meaningful as opposed to going straight from uh, uh, undergrad to MBA. That's my perspective. Uh, uh, that is really insightful considering graduate school myself. I think I'm going to use that. Yeah. Uh, Are you planning master's in engineering or? Uh, I'm planning to go for a master's with PhD track. Okay, great. That's, That's great. 
Awesome. Yeah, that's a lot more years of college and a lot of commitment, but um, I really have to evaluate it once again. I, I, you know, part of me, I, I wanted to do a master's in engineering and then I said, well, I'm gonna work. And then, so one of the things is like, when you work, then you, you kind of get tugged towards the MBA side if you have that inclination of doing business as opposed to engineering. But a couple of my friends did, actually my Purdue colleagues, those, many of those that ended up doing masters at Purdue, in fact, later on got their MBAs, like, so it doesn't, uh, so they all ended up getting an MBA somewhere along their career. Let's just put it that way. That makes sense, yeah. I think uh, at least back, uh, I think a few years ago, MBAs were really important to, you know, get into the jobs and get like relevant promotions mm -hmm. um, to move ahead with your career. So a lot of people used to go for that. That's pretty great. So in general, um, how do you approach making tough decisions like choosing between things or um, like what you should take as your next step? Like you mean uh, as you're graduating or uh, or for me in general, or uh, what, what, what do you mean? I mean, for you in general. Um, well, I think one of the things is like, you can have a plan, but then the plan will always, all of us have this, right? You think of this and you end up like this and just, uh, be proactive about yourself. Maybe sometimes I don't do a good job myself in the sense that I'm the type of person who's curious about everything. And so sometimes it's almost be better to be an expert in one thing. And I'm a little bit of a jack of all trades on many things. And, uh, but I do have wide array of interests. And because of my wide array of interests, I got to walk, work on an opportunity of this AR VR solution uh, that uh, if, you know, some of the latest Star Wars movies, these founders uh, recreated Princess Leia through technology because they, they were working at Disney and what have you know, but then they created this entity called Loom.ai, which could take a digital avatar just from one photograph. And they developed, I didn't work on the AI component, but there are hardcore engineers developing on that, but that solution is now in Roblox. And uh, so what I'm trying to get at is sometimes serendipity leads the way, but I would say if you're technical, I think in this area, some of you may not even need an MBA or, and you could just stay focused and your career will be quite uh, successful. I think you guys have a lot more opportunities and the cost of developing some things. Yes, in hardware, it's still there, but in software, it's almost next to nothing. In the early days, you had to buy big computer boxes. And even for a startup like a gaming startup, we had to raise several million dollars just for buying the computers mm -hmm. and buying hosted space. And then you start uh, uh, doing the development. And uh, so, and hardware side is still a little bit expensive, but the cost of production is a lot less. So I think that way you guys have an opportunity to take a lot more risk. Uh, when we were there, most of the opportunities were big companies like Intel and this new company called Cisco at the time or Westinghouse or General Electric and those type of things. But now you guys have, I think, a lot more choices. So it's it's a hard answer to answer, but I, uh, I think uh, if you stay focused technically, you can't go wrong. And then those of you who want to be business inclined, then do so, all right? Some of you might end up in careers in product management or product development, right? It's, a, but you know, it, it's the same thing, right? If you're working on a product, you're leading the effort to build things and you may wanna be an individual contributor or you may wanna manage people. And for me, some of the opportunities came by just creating businesses or seeking out opportunities and I, I planned it to a certain point, and then after a certain point, some random stuff happened. And uh, yeah, to answer your question, what's my next step? Uh, I don't know yet, but uh, I think there'll be a lot more opportunities coming, even at my age. Uh, so who knows? I'll probably keep continue working. I, I, I can't imagine retiring because there's just so many interesting things to do. Yeah, I like that you're staying open and looking forward to stuff. Yeah.
Um, so there's a more technical question uh, mm -hmm. from the audience. Uh, how do you evaluate your machine learning systems for bias? And if you find bias, how do you address it? I mean, that's a tough question. So that recent question came about, so in WellBrain, it's a digital health company. So I joined this entity because one of the things was, if you look at video games, you're selling an addiction, right? But you're figuring out ways like the human behavior, how to spend more time or how to spend more money. And then I came across this opportunity where it's solving an addiction. So what WellBrain is, is a high level. It's a platform that's enabling physicians to prescribe non-opiate modalities to address chronic pain and fight the opiate epidemic, which is uh, prevalent. And I'll get to the answer, to, but I'm just trying to give you guys a framework. And what that means is we first started out as a point solution offering medically focused, customized guided meditations based on the patient reported outcomes that fed into the system. So the patients have an iPad app and a smartphone at home, and they just give feedback on these clinically validated scales that, uh, you know, that have been established by certain university research. Those scales are then reported back to the physician. And then based on those outputs, we would map, you know, if a person scored high in depression, we'd uh, give them access to the depression things. Now on a much larger front, our, our thing is a platform. So we offer other types of solutions such as access to accelerated approval for outpatient procedures of electrical stimulation. So those of you are inclined in uh, mechanical and electrical engineering, it's basically an implant that sends a wave that cancels the pain wave coming from the brain brainstem. And insurance companies sometimes hold this up. So WellBrain, we figured out a way to get a faster approval for this, such that, that these implants, uh, we eventually will work on the data side of this. But now if you think about these, there's also a couple other solutions we have the platform. So now with respect to bias, we were, I was asked the question, how do you eliminate bias? This was an investor, in fact, uh, last week, an investor asked this in a Zoom call, how do you eliminate bias? And we're working on it, but right now what we're doing is we're giving two options in the sense, based on the scores, a patient may get this customized feedback of their own scores, but then on a flip side, we're doing reverse machine learning is what we decided. We decided to give patients access to anything and everything. So it's not only PTSD or sleep or anxiety, it's like, see what each patients are using and then learn, meaning, oh, we're seeing women aged 35 to 44 using the sleep modules first, then the depression, then the anxiety. Uh, and I don't know, males 55 to 65 are using this. Then based on that, you could uh, make a recommendation. Now there's even a further step further because now there are even details because of the disparities in medical care in this country. There's this concept called social determinants of health. So you need to factor in, hey, if it's someone grown up in a wealthy area, they probably have better health care. So you might make a unbiased or you might make a biased recommendation just because the fact our data sets is only coming from people who can afford to see pain doctors. So how do we apply this to Medicaid? So to answer your question, we, you know, we haven't built our full ML team yet. It's just, we have all the data and it's just sitting there. Now we have to start looking and anecdotally, I can tell you these stories, we need to start uh, looking at this and, you know, who knows, maybe we could put a Kaggle competition on that for people to figure out, or maybe, you know, once we have a little bit of opportunity, if uh, some of you guys want to take a look at it, there could be some opportunity from an intern perspective, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a complex, I'm not an expert, core expert in AI and bias by any means, but uh, at least I can uh, speak to it at a, you know, this level, so. Well, that's, that's really cool. I like the structure of stuff. So um, you're trying to use the uh, input stream to kind of modulate the output. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's, that's really cool. That's nice. And then idea. reverse, yeah, we're trying to take the input stream and modulate the output on larger data sets. So as opposed to you, it's more like 50 people and then see what they're doing. 
as opposed to we being prescriptive. So I don't know what the opposite of word of prescriptive is, but yeah. So yeah, we also have a single lead EEG headset that measures alpha and beta theta waves, but uh, we're looking at the Apple Watch to do pulse oximetry. You know, uh, actually through the flashlight of the phone, you can read the O2 levels in your finger and derive a concept called heart rate variability. Now, this is where the gaming component comes in because if you start better managing yourself and the science has shown, especially for mindfulness, that if you practice deep breathing, your brain waves are jagged when you're in a chronic pain state or on opiates. But if you uh, start doing regular breathing exercises or just even meditation over time, it smooths. And we wanna give that feedback look to the patient so there, there's no AI involved per se, but you could probably take those aggregate data sets, but then the patient uses that as a reinforcement mechanism to better themselves. And the physicians start seeing, okay, this patient is doing better. That sign still has to be published, but getting back to your inputs, these are the type of inputs we're collecting. Wow. And just little nuances like we, you know, if you think about 90 year old patients, we have 15 to 90 year old patients, Bluetooth, if you guys can solve something better than Bluetooth, that'll be, because you know all of us have trouble syncing Bluetooth right in the car and everything. But the reason why we had to do Bluetooth versus a wire, our electrical waves, the impedance of this defeats the signal and it, it becomes noise. So the only way efficiently to do it to Bluetooth, but you try to ask all these patients to configure Bluetooth, they'll just throw away the device and say, ah, I don't wanna use this uh, uh, biofeedback thing. Right. So, you know, maybe the Apple Watch is better uh, for some of that stuff. And that's why we're looking at the flashlight. So that's what I mean. You have to think of other solutions, even though you might think it's the best solution. It may not work practically. Yeah, that, that relates to your previous answer. You know, just keep getting feedback from the, co the consumers themselves. And yeah. you'll know what to do. That's that's yeah, great. data feedback, patient feedback, physician feedback. So there's qualitative and quantitative feedback. So you got to keep incorporating that. All right. Uh, could you tell me about one of the biggest challenges that you have faced in your career, and what steps did you take to tackle that challenge? Well, I've lived through. Even though I've been successful, you get setbacks in the sense that. In the early 2000s, there was a dot-com crash. And even due to NAFTA, I lost my job at Xerox. So I think twice or a couple of times I've lost my job. So sometimes post-NAFTA, it took me six to eight months to find another job. And so that was a challenging moment because when no one's hiring, what do you do? So you become creative and then you work for free or, you know, you, because one of the things employers always want to see is a consistent set of employment, whether you're getting paid or not, that's another story, but as long as you're keeping it. So that's how I overcame it. So I'd say one of the biggest challenges is that, and one of the things for me personally is like, I'm at such a level, like uh, I need to be more focused on some core expertise, which I am on product, but even more sub, uh, to really focus on the next stage. But my advice, I, I would say the biggest challenges were, I've come up, overcome adversity, but at the same time, I've overcome a lot of challenges. And one thing I will say is like, if you keep trying, natural luck will happen. If you stop trying, natural luck will not happen. Uh, and uh, on a professional sense, uh, just a crazy story, a big challenge was in Turkey, I had set up an office there. We were one of the fastest growing gaming companies there because of massively multiplayer online games. It just happened within two weeks, two sons committed, two sons of chief ministers committed suicide because their uh, accounts were hacked. So we got banned from the country. So I, I flew out there, spent weeks. How do you resolve that type of situation being banned from a country? And eventually I got the, banned from stopping being enforced, but that was a big professional challenge because no one knew the expertise. And we were talking to professionals there in the country and a system of lobbying doesn't exist. And what ultimately happened was, this is just an ad hoc story, is the government wanted to figure out how to tax better some of the systems we had in place because at that time, 
internet cafes around the world were big, but no one was paying taxes to that. But we being the bigger pie because our games were being played in internet cafes or students would come in. So they said, you need to collect tax okay. and pay us. So like, okay, the second thing more importantly though, based on that, because of our expertise of working in Korea and other countries, they wanted a rating system. We advised them on creating the rating systems for their games in their country. So the parents would have an idea of what's going on. And if you think, I look now, China has putting this enforcement right of just three hours a week for games for kids, because yeah, if you spend that much time, it's, you know, some games is good, but at the same time, you know, you, you, you want things like that. So that was a challenge. You have to have an analytical mind to start thinking, how can you solve the problem, whether it's a human problem? And I think the you know, engineering mindset, you kind of think analytically and uh, you know, that's, that's what uh, school prepares for you, right? Yeah. Yeah, that is a great answer. Um, a member of the audience would also wanna know a little bit more about your concerns uh, about data collection and privacy as um, biometrics are becoming uh, more of a regular thing among people. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, so we're uh, entirely HIPAA compliant, but the HIPAA, if you guys might know, is what's uh, in the United States required for you know protecting patient information. So we have to do all these minute details the at rest and even the RESTful APIs, but it has to be double encrypted we have to make sure the iPad, the, so technically we have these iPads, but the data collection, the iPad is just a presentation layer and actually the data is immediately sent to the server. Now, do we know it's 100% foolproof while it's being sent? We don't know yet, but we're trying to make that maybe not a VPN type uh, connection because if you do VPN, that just slows the bandwidth down. And so, yeah, to answer your question, we try to take it as serious as much as possible. We do know being a healthcare website, like one of our lead engineers keeps saying, he can sense all these, you know, bad actors trying to sniff around our website and stuff. And you, you hear about, you know, what, six or eight months ago, the lack of uh, technology safeguard and security at some of the, you know, the I don't know, meatpacking companies that shut down and that oil company, right? And that's because they didn't follow basic uh, guidelines on security. So to answer your question about the sensitivity of patient information, we, if we look at the data or anything, it is de-identified data. So even if the analysis of the data, it's, you know, you can never link that patient to that data. And uh, yeah, we're trying to follow some best practice as a startup as much as we can. Um, and, uh, you know, we host our stuff on Amazon and do the requirements in the healthcare system. And then as we work with hospital, uh, as we work in, uh, sorry, uh, hospital systems and also insurance companies, they'll have much more detailed uh, uh, integration layers that the whole um, medical industry has, have the HL7 and all these little uh, techniques or S standards, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is a great answer. Um, on a higher level, uh, now that it's 755, I wanted to ask you, how do you choose to define success? Success can come in many ways. Yes, you can think of monetary success or you can think of personal success and accomplishment success. So from a business perspective, you try to establish goals like KPIs, key performance indicators. Okay, I need to, we need to re release this first version of product in three months, or we want to aim for 20,000 users doing this. So those are micro successes. But then overall, for me, for example, in the digital health success is just the, what is it called? unsolicited feedback from either our physicians or patients. So this patient sent me a note uh, saying, Smith, this is the first time in my life I can go to work on a consistent basis. I do a daily mindful meditation for 10 minutes and I'm good. Before that, he had gone through multiple rounds of surgeries, multiple prescription pains. So that makes you feel good because we just help someone 
uh, improve their lives. So that's a success. Uh, so it's very hard to define success, but I think as I, I think two ways, it's like, yes, there's part of me that wants to have the financial success and then two, the personal success of uh, being good at whatever I do and then seeing people use it. You get a good uh, thrill out of that when you see it happen. And especially you feel even better when you unexpected when people come up and uh, thank you. So it's, uh, it's yeah, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's an interesting question and it, you always push yourself. If you want to push yourself harder, then you make the next step a little bit more hard, harder. So you don't take the easy way out. Now, part of me does that. It's like, oh, I'm just going to sit back and then, but then I think about, okay, what do we got to do next for, uh, with, with WellBrain right now? It's like, okay, what do I have to do next? What do I have to tell the board that, hey, we got to do this, this, and this for the next step. So success comes in different ways. So you just have to find it for yourself, your personal and uh, professional, but make sure, try to make the next success a harder than the previous success. So it pushes you. Yeah, that is very well phrased. I like that. And uh, is there any final piece of advice that you would like to give to students in this room? Is, is, sorry, is there any final advice for what? Uh, that you would like to give to students in this room? Uh, let's see, there's probably quite a bit of advice I could give. Uh, I would say once you graduate, make sure you have the good classes in your hand and stay focused on what you want to do. If it's hardware, be focused. Uh, the only drawback I would say in my career is like, I wish I would have taken being a little more technical. One of the things, I don't know if you guys feel this way, I hate debugging. For me, the code should work the first time and that's it if you're on the software side of things. <laughs> and that's why I get frustrated. But, you know, make sure you're, if you want to go the master's engineering route, I, my suggestion is do that sooner than later because it's going to be harder to go back, especially in engineering. That's my view. And then MBA, if you're more business inclined, uh, do that. But overall, my biggest piece of advice would be just stay really focused and maybe be more of a specialist. I see a lot more value in uh, being a specialist. Uh, you know, what if you decide to become the CEO, you have to become a generalist and be knowledgeable about everything. But there's a lot more value add in that, and uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities in that, whether it's in, AI, robotics, you see it all across. And uh, yeah, I think, and don't discount uh, The Lean Startup, that's the book. If you can write that down, The Lean Startup, it's uh, written about eight, nine years ago. I think he was a former engineer, but he really focused on product, but it'll give you good insights and how to think about designing products, how to get, you know, you know, the primary research, and that will help any of you a lot. And that'll just give you perspective on how from an engineering or development perspective, whether it's hardware or software, you can then develop a better products and solution and hopefully do it faster. All right, I think uh, you guys may hear things like Facebook's motto is break things fast. It's more, it, what it means is just rapidly iterate. And there's this whole tradition. So when we graduated, there was just this concept called waterfall, which is design, you know, do design everything, then build. Mm -hmm. But I think you can do that even with manufacturing and even, do, I don't know if the school teaches ag agile methodology or rapid iteration. So there's this concept. And I apply that even on the business side of things in the sense that, hey, you marketing and business folks, we, we got to aim for two week goals of doing this. And that just comes from engineering which is uh, opposite of waterfall is agile. And so I'm digressing here a bit, but to answer your question, I think uh, really look at product management or product engineering as another concept as well. That, that never was presented to me back then because I don't think that existed when I was growing up and uh, graduating, but uh, that could be a good field for many of you. All right. 
Uh, thank you for talking. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you guys found it informative and uh, interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sumit, thank you so much uh, for that uh, for that amazing discussion. Um, I think closing with this discussion of agile uh, is fitting because it seems like you've been very agile throughout your career, and I think uh, all of us should aspire to be uh, similarly agile. Uh, so, Avik, thank you very much for uh, for moderating the discussion. Uh, Sumit, thanks a lot for the wisdom. I, I learned a lot from from chatting with you, or from hearing from you. It was it was great. I hope everybody else also learned a lot. Um, and so, thank you again. For, for spending the time with us. And ideally the perfect job for me if I could just be a perpetual student, just take courses all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm in academia. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so yeah, if uh, anyone wants to reach out, uh, you guys can contact your engineering department. I'm happy to talk to anyone, so. Thanks. Thank I don't know. Thanks, all of, thanks to everyone for joining us um, for this first Stories of Success seminar.